I was born on April 5th, 1920 at Dalton, Cook County, Illinois. And uh, Dalton was the first village south of the city of Chicago limits and about 20 miles from the south of the Chicago Loop. And the population was about 2,900 in 1930 and about 3,000 in 1940. There are four railroads within two to 400 yards of our house. and. The Indiana Harbor Belt Line had considerable traffic, but it was transferring freight cars around the south end of the lake, Michigan. And there was no railroads go through Chicago. I mean, everything has to go around the bottom of the lake. So they were bringing a lot of traffic around. Some en railroad engineers and, and other railroad workers lived in our neighborhood. And when the manufacturing of steel mills, uh, brick factories, et cetera, et cetera, companies closed up. There was a loss of work for the railroads and, uh, that did local transfer work because they laid off a lot of the jobs. Uh, my father was a railroad engineer with 25 years with the railroad and he had to go back firing because it was so many jobs were laid off. The railroads, the Pennsylvania went south of us the CNEI, or Chicago and Eastern Illinois, went west of us, and the uh, Belt Line uh, went north of us. And the Belt Line had a train every, about every five minutes. So you had to watch the, if you were, they were about 200 yards north of the house, so if you wanted to go north, you had to wait and see if you could hear a train whistling for a road crossing, and then you could make a run for it. There was a lot of, uh, Hobos later on it came through too from that. Oh, he, when he went back firing, he had a loss of pay of quite a bit. And uh, also, we had a big tree in the front yard, uh, cottonwood that was dying back. And it was so close to the house, he uh, decided to cut it down. And he had undercut it and he had a rope pulling it down and the rope broke and he broke his ankle. And he lost about six weeks of work. And that's when things got rough. And it was about that time I was growing up. I was five foot four in grade school. And then in the next two years, I grew to 5'11". And uh, of course, my clothes did not fit. So I wore a lot of hand-me-downs. And I can remember my great, well, one of my uncles wore a size 10 shoe and I wore about eight and a half and the front of him curled up like that when I walked. And I had to go to high school wear clothes like that. Uh, some of the neighbors had boys that were about two or three years older than I was and I got a lot of their shirts. A lot of this stuff didn't fit, but I wore it. I mean, it was just, that, that was it. My mother was a good seamstress and she made over a lot of the clothes that I could wear. Like I had a Sunday suit that uh, was way too short and she cut up the vest and added it to it so I could wear it and it was a reasonably decent suit then. Also, my teeth were coming in crooked and uh, a dentist lived across the street from us. My mother went over to see him about getting my teeth straightened. And he said, okay, uh, she said, well, how much will it be? And he said it would be so-and-so, which was more than my dad made in a whole month. So that ended that, and I ended up with crooked teeth. The women cooked their breads, coffee cakes, and cookies on Saturday afternoons. And that neighborhood smelled wonderful. I mean, you, I don't know if you ever had fresh bread and coffee cakes and all that cooked in the neighborhood. And 
So we would run home when they were cooking and uh, get some hot coffee cake. And my mother used uh, what they call streusel on the top. I don't know if you ever heard of it, but uh, it's a concoction of sugar and margarine. And uh, where you put a slab of butter, uh, margarine on that and hot uh, coffee cakes, why, it was real good eating. And when the hot bread came out, you'd take a slice of it and do the same. And it was good eating. A lot of the mothers around there were of German descent. And a lot of them did their own canning and things like that. Everybody had a garden that uh, got some of it. And then those others had great big gardens where they could sell their produce to the neighbors. The margarine we came from had uh, was a white lard-like looking. And they gave you a capsule that changed, you mixed up with it and it changed it to a yellow so it looked like, uh, like regular butter. We had uh, relatives that lived in Wisconsin on a dairy farm and uh, they made their own butter. And when we went up to visit them, well, their butter didn't look or taste anything like our butter because it was real butter. But our butter had a, a saltier uh, flavor and it was also darker colored and all the rest, but it was amazing what good butter tastes like. Oh, everybody had a garden and raised their own vegetables and sold some, and we got asparagus and rhubarb from a, a back door neighbor, and he also raised chickens to supply him with uh, protein. We had a lot of uh, problems with English sparrows, and the man would go out there and put out grain for the chickens and the sparrows would just come in and take over so we all had BB guns along there we were shooting English sparrows all the time I don't know if people liked that idea but we we went with it because it kept the population down bulk milk was sold for 35 cents a gallon and you brought your own container and uh, I don't know whether it is within the laws or not but that's what they had it and eggs were 12 cents a dozen and uh, we, we had a, usually somebody that raised chickens that could give us eggs, or we could buy eggs from them. I can remember my mother used to make baked beans. She would make a great big pot, and we would eat baked beans for about three or four days. Also, in that era, rabbits were shot, and we ate a lot of rabbits for protein in those days, uh, especially when the snow was on the ground and we could track them. In the fall, these trains that came through were carrying corn or grain, and they put them in boxcars, but they put paper around to keep it from leaking out. And when a train would come to a stop, the grain would leak out in the right away. And you'd see a pile of corn there, and the pigeons would come in, and sometimes blackbirds would come there. So we shot pigeons and blackbirds that way. We called those pigeons railroad ducks because of that. With all the traffic we had coming through town, the hobos would come in on these trains. And uh, when the train stopped, well, usually they would get off and uh, come into town and they would see us playing in the yard or walking around. They'd say, can you have your mother see about giving us a piece of bread? We're starving and then had anything to eat for days. So we would go in and tell mother there's a hobo out there that's starving. And uh, usually there, sometimes it'd be two or three of them. So, Usually my mother would cut a piece of bread, put a little margarine and sugar on it, and give each one a piece of bread. And uh, that kept them going all day, I guess. There was a housing boom in the late 1920s. And uh, there were very good times. So our grade school added on to the old building that was there. And it put in a new gym. And in the basement, they had uh, woodworking tools for the boys and home economics for the girls with stoves and uh, sewing machines and things like that. But in 1932, I believe it was, I was in the sixth grade and they let all the teachers go but the ones that were teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic. So uh, we never did get to use all that other equipment and we very seldom used the gym. And a really depression hit in 1932 in our era. And uh, so that's when things really got bad. 
and in, so bad that there was just a few teachers there. So the principal was supposed to be teaching us. We were in sixth grade, sixth grade I believe it was, civics. And he was so busy, we never got to see him, you might say. So in the summertime, when, or when the warm, weather warmed up, the windows would be opened up, and uh, we had nothing else to do but catch flies. So we would catch flies, and everybody got good at catching them. And we'd take the wings off and then dip them in the ink wells and then put them on a piece of paper and see where they trail the trail they made on it. So that kept them busy for a while. But when we get too noisy, why the local teachers would come around and you know calm us down, and then we well we'd play around for a while more, but not very long. Oh, I noticed in his book uh, about Dalton history, the school was closed in the month of February 1933. Now I don't remember that, and. Uh, it was extending the school period to work through to July 1st. And that way they saved about $500 on oil and heat and electricity. And uh, so that, that we got a month off in the winter anyway. At that time, the principal's salary was, it was cut in 1932 by $800. And then in 1933, it was cut another $400. So his salary was $3,000 a year at that time. So uh, most of the salaries around those days was, uh, I would say, a, a, between $100 and $150 a month. And if you made $200 a month, you were rich. In high school, I went to the Thornton Township High School, which was about four miles from where I lived, but we had to ride a bus over there. And uh, if you missed the bus, you could walk the mile to the local railroad that ran over there and another half a mile to get to school. So you made sure you didn't miss a bus. Now, with the railroad traffic going through there, the buses were sometimes late. High school was overcrowded and they uh, added rooms. But as they were adding on during the school year, they were very crowded. So the Freshmen and sophomores went in the morning, and the juniors and seniors went in the afternoon to keep down the crowding. It lasted about a year or so on that program. Uh, also, our high school basketball team was state champs two years running, so everybody attended those basketball games. They had a good football team, but we never went to the uh, uh, state championships. Our graduating class was about 475 students and the total enrollment for the high school was about 2,500 students. As I remember high school, uh, I had a bad case of acne and I, didn't, I wasn't very active socially, and, uh, but they did have a, a good curriculum. We had a lot of sports activities. We played uh, tennis, uh, we had swim teams, uh, we had a lot of extra activities, but we, we lived four miles for that, so it was hard for us to get there to do a lot of this stuff. In the early 1930s, I don't know if you ever read about Dillinger, but they were doing a lot of bank robbing around there. And uh, uh, the banks reciprocated by putting uh, bulletproof glass in front of the tellers and arming the door so they couldn't get in. And that slowed a lot of that down in our neighborhood. The adjoining village, uh, the South Holland, uh, lived on an interstate and they were a very rich community. And that, they had the only Packard agency around there. So the make sure that the bank wasn't robbed, they had a guard sitting, armed guard sitting up in the loft so that he could cover any of this bottom of the bank down there. So we didn't have any bank robberies in our town or those, that village, or our village either. So One of Dalton's only police officers was shot in 1936. Uh, he stopped a, a car of four boys and uh, he was 
I don't know what he was, he gave him a ticket, but I, he was directing him to how to get to our city hall, and he got in the car to, to tell him the directions. And one in the back seat, a boy shot him in the back of the head. And uh, they threw the body out, and then they took off, and uh, they ran into a tree, and they caught the boys, three of them. And one of them got away. And the one that got away was running around the area, and he was recognized a couple of places. And I was at the uh, fire station when the call came in that he had been shot and they were going to set up a posse to locate the boy that was missing. And uh, so they blew the this fire siren to get everybody to come in. And when they came in, they were notified to get their shotguns and rifles and we'd, they set up a posse to go around the neighborhoods looking for this fella. But they never did find him. But if they'd ever found him, why, that would have been the end of them because they weren't ready to, to catch or capture him. The three that were caught were sentenced to from 14 to 35 years. They were all 18 to 21 years old when they did this. So you can see it just wasted a bunch of years there. Oh, in our neighborhood in about mid 30s, there was a cat burglar and uh, he would get into people's houses and rob them and nobody noticed it. I mean, you know, they, they, they didn't find him. And he got so bold that he went into the police chief's house it was seen by the police chief crawling around on the floor with a knife in his mouth, he said. But he didn't get a, he didn't get a good look at him, so he couldn't identify him. And of course, the boy got away. But they start having suspects, so they start putting pressure on some of these suspects, and that slowed it down and finally quit. So, but one of my neighbors had a lot of guns, and uh, he used to shoot in the backyard. He had a target set up with a, a hole about that big that he shot at 22 in. Now this is in town, but he had a backstop. And uh, I can remember one time uh, he used a high power rifle in and it went right through the backstop and threw a steel plate behind it and went up town somewhere. We don't know where the bullet went to. But he used to sit out there with his 22 and you could hear him, he had like a uh, a brake lining that when he put a bullet through that hole, it would ring like a bell. So you could hear him sitting there, bang, wing, bang, wing. He was good. And this burglar got into his house and stole some guns. Now, if he'd have caught that guy, he wouldn't have had to worry about him either. So that was some of the days. Oh, my mother was a great baseball fan of the Chicago Cubs. And we lived in the first suburb south of Chicago, and uh, the streetcar came to the end of 138th Street, was where our, our house number was 141, so it was a few blocks away from us. So a group of ladies would go down, and they would catch the streetcar and ride for about probably an hour and a half to get to Cubs Park, which is on the north side of the loop, about 30 3,500, I think it was uh, the address up there. And it was Lady Days free, got in free on Thursdays. So that's why they, so it cost them about 20 cents to see the ball game all day. I mean, traffic and all the rest. And occasionally they took us, younger boys, we were under, we were about 12, I think, or under, and they, we got in free also. My mother also listened to the Cubs on the radio and she was a great fan, and she could tell you the uh, batting averages and all that of the uh, players, and uh, she was real interested in it. My mother did her laundry on Monday, and she'd start about six o'clock in the morning, and she would, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen Fells Nap the soap, but it was a strong soap. She would chip it off into a boiler, and then put the dirty clothes in and boil them for a because my dad was a railroad engineer on a steam locomotive and they'd fired it with coal. So he had a lot of dirty clothes. And then she would rinse them in tubs we had and then wring them out and then hang them up. And uh, during the warmer weather, she would hang them outside. Well, these trains that came through uh, would sometimes have to stop before they got, because there was, Three railroads crossed at one point, 
So to, they had to get clearing to get across it. And a lot of times they came up, they had to stop the train. And if they had a mile of cars, which is about 120 or 130 cars, it was a long way. So uh, to start it, the locomotive would back up and take the slack out of every car as it went back. And then he had to pick them up one car at a time so he could get the whole train moving. And as he started out, it would go whoosh, 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 whoosh. And every time it did, it would blow the cinders and stuff out the stack and all over the neighborhood. And my mother would have her clothes hanging on the line and she would get all these soot and cinders falling all over her clean clothes. She would cuss out those engineers. And my dad was an engineer and she'd take it out of him too. So uh, she'd have to take it in and wash them again usually. So that, that didn't make her any happier either. Of course, a lot of the other neighbors had the same problem. I mean, the women were complaining to the uh, local city council and saying, anything you can do about it? And they said, it's railroad standard practice, so nothing we can do about it. So it's the way things went. Usually, my mother would finish up washing about 2 p.m. And then the next day, she would iron the clothes. And then on Wednesday, she would mend them. And we had patches on our patches in those days. And what hot me was, People sell clothes now, new ones, with patches on them, with holes in them. <laughs> that was a standard <laughs> dress for us, so we were evidently ahead of our time at that way. Also, on Saturday, my mother was German and she was a very neat, clean housekeeper. So on Saturdays, my sister or I had to clean the, ki the kitchen, bathroom, and pantry and we would get down on our hands and knees and scrub it. So it would take about an hour to, to scrub the kitchen clean and she would clean the rest of the house. When I was about 14 years old, I believe it was, we started playing tennis and we, we had two tennis courts. I mean, one was about a mile north of us and about another was a mile west of us. And they had four courts in each one, but they had been clay courts because the maintenance of a clay court is very high, they macadamized it and kept the surface a little rough. And we used to play, <coughs> play tennis, oh, sometimes twice a day. And uh, the macadam surface was rough on, a t on the covers of the tennis ball. So a lot of times we were playing with nothing but rubber balls. I mean, and if you ever had a, anybody ever bought new ones, why everybody got, got to play with them then. You know. It was awful. Well, we played past egg football in the fall and also did hunting rabbits in the fall. And when it got cold enough, we ice skated. And uh, the clay holes had a steep side to them. And there was a dump on one end where you, they'd get a sign, say four or five feet long, and roll up the front and then slide down. And one fella had that. and. When he hit the bottom, and instead of having a slope on it, it hit Paul Square, and he cut that thing right up. It was just about cut his nose off in there. So that ended that practice. We also played a lot of baseball in those days. Whenever the summertime came, they had baseball leagues all the time and games going in our park. And the park was about a mile away, so uh, we either rode our bikes down there or walked. And I know a few times, uh, there would be a train on the local uh, tracks that would be set there and eating their lunches, parked. So we'd go up there and ask them if they were going down to the park, which was about almost a mile down there. And they'd say, well, we're just about finished. We'll, we'll go down there. So they gave us a ride down there. Uh, we got an easy evening that way. When we were younger, uh, there was a forest preserve south of us about five miles and we would go down and play in the forest reserve. Now, all around the city, and I don't know if it all around Illinois, they set aside a section of land, which is 640 acres, for forest reserve, and it was not developed, touched, or anything. No roads, nothing in it. So that's where we used to play. And this forest reserve that we played in had a creek running through it. And the creek, uh, of course, had steep sides and good, all the rest of that stuff. And, uh, 
we used to play around there and had a lot of timber on it too, so we used to play in the trees and had a ball diamond. So we would walk the five miles down there and play around all day and eat our lunch down there and then walk the five miles back. So we got our exercise that way. The WPA, or Works Progress Administration, came in about, I believe it was 35, and we had a lot of clay holes around the area where they'd gotten the clay out to make bricks from. And a lot of them were abandoned after they got all the clay out and they'd filled with water. So the WPA took the end of one and leveled it out and then put sand on it so they made a beach out of it and they, that was our swimming area. And uh, it was about five miles from home. Uh, the Pennsylvania railroad tracks went all those to it so we would get out and walk the five miles along the railroad track, spend the day swimming or go, well, we played around in the water and then eat our lunch there and then in the evening or at four or five o'clock, we would walk the five miles back again. So we had full days that way. We never had trick or treating at those days. Everybody went around soaping windows. And uh, if you hated the pe people that were lived there, why well, you used wax instead of soap on the windows. And that was rough getting off. And uh, also some of the neighbors around there that were a little older and a little rougher, they would go out in the rural areas where they had outhouses and tip over outhouses all the time. And uh, we heard of one time, uh, they house, hoisted a cow up on the top of our grade school. Now how they got it up there, I don't remember, but I remember they said that they had it up there. So they used to do all kinds of things in Halloween those too. There was a lot of diseases that went in those times that killed you. And I remember some of them such as uh, polio, pneumonia, double pneumonia, diphtheria, TB, and appendicitis. And uh, I lost friends and stuff like that that died. One boy, I remember, he was about 12 and he had polio and he was crippled for a while and then he died. Uh, one of the girls that I went to school with died from TB. I mean, in those days, TB wasn't as bad as it was before, but it was still bad. and. Uh, one of my cousins died from appendicitis about, oh, shortly before I had appendicitis. And uh, I had a stomach ache coming home from school one day, and my mother said, well, go to bed. So the next morning, it was hurting like heck over on the right side, so she called the doctor, and he came to the house. They came to the house in those days. And he said, get him to the hospital immediately. So they drove me over to the hospital about four miles away and he operated immediately. And my mother said he show, showed him the appendix. It was about like that. And the very tip of it had a blister on it and looked like it was ready to break. And he said it was a matter of hours before it would have broken. And that meant the end of me. Now I talked to several people that were living up north. I think one of them was from Cleveland. And his appendix burst and they had try out, they were trying out penicillin. They gave him penicillin and it saved his life. But he was one of the very few that I've heard, heard that lived through it in the, in the late 30s. Uh, of course, penicillin was developed and went to war, war with it in World War II. We always went to church wearing our best clothes. Now I notice everybody wears blue jeans and t-shirts and stuff like that. It makes you wonder. I mean, we were taught that when you went there, well, you, you dressed your best. And also, when you went to a doctor, you dressed your best, too. Everybody dressed up. The labor around there, uh, well, everybody would, there was, there was plenty of uh, labor, but no jobs. The surrounding area, or rather the adjacent area of South Holland, uh, there were a bunch of Hollanders. And <coughs> they raised onions from seed to uh, set size, which is about the size of a marble. So uh, in the summer, late summer, we would go there and they would harvest them. And we would scoop onions, they call it. We would grab a handful like that and shake the dirt out and throw in a bushel basket. We got three cents a bushel for that. And if you took the tops and wrung them out and broke the tops off, you got six cents a bushel for that. So if you work like, well, hard, you would make about 15 to 18 cents an hour. 
it wasn't really a profitable. There weren't many other jobs available to us at the time either. But I remember when we were, say, in that period of, uh, oh, the Depression, we used to play a lot of tennis. And the tennis courts were well used. Everybody played tennis. And after the war, I went out there, and we had those same two tennis courts with four courts each a mile away. And there was nobody playing tennis anymore. I don't know what happened. I guess they were all working. And jobs were available to the younger boys and girls at that time, so nobody played anything like tennis. There was another thing that came in as far as radio. Uh, when I was younger, uh, they used to use crystal sets, just little, what's called, and you'd hear somebody bragging, I got KDEA so Cincinnati or Pittsburgh or whatever it was, and you'd get the skip right, and they could get those long, long range stations a long way off. And uh, later on, they made the radios in big cabinets. And uh, then later on, they made them in smaller cabinet, or smaller uh, editions, and everybody had one by that time. So, but it was amazing how uh, it developed so fast. And it, from the, say, late 20s to the 40s, why they had uh, almost a revolution there. And when I was younger, uh, somewhere around the mid-30s, uh, there were two small boys about my age uh, were out playing, and they never came home, and they never did find them. We don't know whatever happened to them. They were probably 15, 16 years old at the time, and the Calumet River or Little Calumet was about, oh, a half a mile from our house, and we used to go down there. Uh, we didn't swim at it because it was too, I mean, it, it was too polluted. But uh, they were thinking he might have been playing down there, but their bodies never showed up if, you know, if they'd been in the water. And they, uh, as far as, I often inquired about them, and nobody ever heard of them again. CCCs were developed in 1933, and uh, there was a six-month enlistment, and it, you were paid $50 a month, but $25 was sent to your home, to, so they got the money. You, you didn't get but $5 for it. And uh, they did a lot of work around there. Uh, oh, I remember they, they planted a lot of trees. Uh, they also built dams, and they built small roads, and. Uh, did firefighting uh, when we had fires. Uh, they laid out telephone lines and strung the wire, and uh, they raised bridges and worked on reservoirs and stuff like that. And in uh, 1935, they set up the WPA, and they, I think, had eight million people working on the WPA. And uh, they built hospitals and libraries, but our school at that time uh, didn't have much of a playground. Our school backed up to a clay hole. It was about probably 150 yards to the clay hole. So that area back there was leveled off and a baseball diamond was built there. So uh, they, we could play baseball, play soccer and all that. It, was, it probably was about 200 yards long and about 100 yards wide in the fields that they made for us. So. Uh, also, that people don't realize is in about the mid-30s, the Dust Bowl in the Midwest, mainly Oklahoma and Kansas, was blowing all over the area. And I can remember uh, when we would have a good southwest wind, uh, now this was, say, imagine six, eight hundred miles from Oklahoma, uh, we would have dust storms in Illinois. And I can remember the dust, my mother would keep the windows closed, but the dust would come in under the windows and build up on the sills where you have little mounds of silt on the sills. So uh, it was rough on the farmers around there too. Now we had cars at that time. The doctors earlier, when I was born, well, I guess he had, the doctor had a, when I was born in 19, 
20, uh, the, it was April 5th and Chicago had a, a big snowstorm and she was afraid the doctor couldn't get there, but I believe he had a car and was able to make it. So we did have big snowstorms in those days too. So, uh, no, we used to go later on, we used to go into the city of Chicago in the later 30s and uh, watch football games and uh, also basketball games. Uh, when we were younger in school, grade school and high school, uh, we would go down and visit the city museums. Like they used to take us down to Field Museum in Chicago and wander around there and then they had an industrial museum in, uh, oh, I don't know, it was somewhere up in the city, but it wasn't downtown and they used to take us through there. And they had locomotives and uh, submarines and all things like that in them. Uh, we also had an, uh, an observatory that uh, they take us out to occasionally too. So we got to see a lot of those things. Unemployment was somewhere around 25%. And uh, in 1937, I think it had gotten down to 14%. And I graduated in 1938, and they had a recession then. And the unemployment went up to 20%. And I was looking for a job at that time, so you can imagine. And uh, uh, I had appendicitis in March of that year, so I wasn't real, you might say, physical at the time. So later on, uh, my neighbor across the street ran the local newspaper and print shop. And he said, I'll hire you as a apprentice apprentice if you want to try it out. And it would be two bits or 25 cents an hour. So I worked for 25 cents an hour for about oh, I don't know, three or four months there. And then uh, he said, well, I told him I didn't think I would wanted to be a printer, but uh, I decided to make, see if I make a little more money by working uh, a job opening. It was downtown Chicago and Printer's Row down there. And I was making about, I think it was 16 or $17 a week there. And uh, of course, I had to ride the Illinois Central Railroad to get downtown, so was one of those things. There would be West Madison Street was like uh, hobo jungles, you might say. And uh, the street that I worked on was called uh, Plymouth Court or Printer's Row. And I remember going to work in the mornings and you'd see uh, drunks laying in the doorways and sometimes you'd see a, a or we call them meat wagons, to picking up the dead bodies around there. And I can remember one morning, there were several nightclubs along from where I went to work, uh, and they were coming out in their evening dress clothes at about, oh, 7.30 in the morning. <laughs> so they had a fine time that night. <laughs> and uh, there were a, a lot of you might say beggars around at the area too, when I was working down there. And one night I was working a little late and it was about 6.30 and most of the downtown area had gone away. So I was walking along the street and there was a beggar sitting on the corner down ahead of me and I noticed that he went around the corner. So as I got down there, there was a limousine sitting there and a chauffeur and the chauffeur lifted him in the limousine and he, he had a little square box with uh, tires or wheels on it that he also put inside. And then they drove off. And I never gave a beggar another nickel, a nickel after that. I mean, it was amazing. I mean, I, I don't know what a limousine cost in those days, but it was a lot of money. I can remember working down there in the wintertime. And uh, the wind would come down, I think it was LaSalle Street, and it was on a northern direction, and the wind would come down and it was funneled down between the large buildings, and it was like a hurricane coming down there. It was probably 30 mile, 40 mile an hour winds coming down there. And women would walk around, come around that corner and hit the, <laughs> they would grab their hats and grab their skirts and <laughs> it would really hit them. And the, the men, of course, would grab their hats right quick too, so.
the uh, building boom break, broke about 29, I think it was, and the brick factories, caught, um, I mean, they stopped at that time. And they had employed a lot of local people, or not a lot, but some local people. And the, uh, there was no jobs at that time available for that type of work. And of course, construction crews that were, had been working during the late 20s were laid off because there was no building going on. The contractors had no work to do. And uh, it was rough around there. And the steel mill that was in a neighboring town or village, uh, later on they were only working one or two days a month. And uh, the railroads, my dad was a railroad engineer and he, uh, when he went back firing, uh, he, he lost a lot of money, and I don't know what he was making, but it probably was in uh, twice as much as he was making the firing engine. And uh, so a lot of those, well, he had 25 years service in that, so when he was put back firing, why he lost a lot of seniority of the engineers. I mean, each engineer and fireman has their own seniority system. So he he, he could got a pretty good job. He used to work 11 to 7 all the time, and uh, we never saw him very much because they worked 12 hours, I mean, about 10, 10 hours, uh, sometimes 12 hours a day or night, and uh, he would be sleeping when we came home, and when he, we came home, he was working, so we very seldom saw him. Sometime in about 1932 or 33, I believe it was, uh, we only had two bedrooms in the house, and uh, uh, I had an older sister and myself, and we had to use the same bedroom. So they, my dad knew a contractor. Of course, he didn't have any work to do, so he contracted to uh, uh, add up to the upstairs uh, uh, three bedrooms. So they put the bedrooms in, and. Uh, I can remember one time the contractor was talking with my dad and he was saying he, he had probably a hundred thousand out dollars out in bad debts that he never could get because people owed him for the work that they had done and the depression hit. Now during that period of about uh, oh in the thirties, mid well the early thirties, uh, a lot of people well in the housing boom, they bought a lot of lots. I mean, the uh, area that uh, around this, uh, Dalton uh, was prairie and they subdivided it and cleaned off the road uh, area for roads and built sidewalks. And when we'd rabbit hunt, we used to go rabbit hunting down the sidewalks. But uh, a lot of those lots were tremendously priced high. Uh, it was about Twenty years later, before the area was developed again, and my sister developed, built a house in one of those areas, and that was about the same price as it was twenty years ago. And uh, then everything at that time expanded, and uh, so all the open areas were built up. Before the depression came, and they cut off all the passenger service, uh, my Dad would give us free passes. So we would go down, I mean, my mother took us downtown shopping. I mean, the loop. And uh, we would ride that train back and forth. It was about 20 miles. And uh, so I can remember, this was probably a little before the Depression set in, but uh, going into a train shed that these big road engines would be lined up with passenger train behind them, getting ready to pull out and they were loading up. And when we walked by, they, there was a lot of soft coal used for the engines. And uh, it was very smoky in there. And that, it was, smoke was, a, it was, the coal was dirty coal, a lot of soot. And uh, I can remember, you walk along, the steam engine was right alongside of you, and they had six foot drive wheels on it, that road engines had big ones and a, uh, what's called local track, it had small wheels. 
And uh, when you went by it, you could smell the hot iron and smell the steam and oil. And uh, that mixed with the smoke, it was re really distinctive. 